Greetings everyone, by the grace and mercies of God. I hope that this video finds you well. Discipleship, both personal and family, is the primary focus of this channel. This is episode 5 of the Theology in Real Life podcast, where we help you take heart knowledge and head knowledge and apply them in everyday life. Today, we're going to answer the question, what is discipleship? First, we're going to look at the Great Commission passage and hear from Dr. Jeff Moore about the original languages because it's really relevant today. Next, we will hear from Pastor John MacArthur in this sermon series as he teaches us what the marks of a true disciple, true discipleship, actually are according to God from his word. Let's begin by first looking at Matthew 28, 16 through 20, which many of us know as the Great Commission passage. Let's read it together. Open your copy of God's Word, if you can. We'll be beginning Matthew 28, beginning in verse 16. Now the eleven disciples went to Galilee, to the mountain to which Jesus had directed them. And when they saw him, they worshipped him. But some doubted, and Jesus came and said to them, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Go, therefore, and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you. And behold, I am with you always to the end of the age. Now we're going to spend a few minutes kind of breaking this down and seeing what we can learn from God and his word. So if you look at verse 16, it begins, now the 11 disciples went to Galilee. We see that there are only 12, 11 disciples now since Judas betrayed Jesus, which proved that he was not a true disciple of Jesus or a believing one who trusted in him, but that he was the son of perdition in John 17, 12 as part of the predetermined plan that Jesus would die for the sins of his people. We see Jesus directed them, he says, to the mountain to which Jesus had directed them. They went to Galilee to a mountain that Jesus directed them to. In 2018, I was in Israel, and the only mountain I remember in Galilee was Mount Arbel. One of the first things we did on that trip was hike three miles up the, up the mountain um, to the top of Mount Arbel. I actually have um, some artifacts that I took with me. Here's a quick video and a few photos from that day. This mountain oversees the Sea of Galilee, the road from Galilee to Nazareth, Tiberias, and you can see Capernaum. And you can even see the Golan Heights near the Lebanon and Syria border off in the distance. It was really an amazing opportunity. Um, it's not really safe there now, but if you ever get the opportunity, I, I encourage you to take a trip there. So in verse 17, and when they saw him, they worshiped him, but some doubted. So when they saw Jesus, we also see some of the disciples worshiping him and some doubting. Put yourself in their shoes for a minute. Would you be tempted to doubt that this was a real person who was risen from the dead after just seeing him brutally crucified recently? We all might be tempted, uh, but the grace of God, some worshiped, and, uh, and by the grace of God, um, these true disciples were the believing ones who would serve him. In verse 18, we see something beautiful. And Jesus came and said to them, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. What Jesus is doing here is he's proclaiming that 
All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to him from the Father. All authority. Now, there is, now is there anything that exists in all the universe that does not fall subject to the authority of Jesus Christ? God says no. All authority belongs to Christ Jesus. This is the foundation for the rest of the Great Commission. So, in light of believe, knowing, believing, and living in the fact that Christ is King of heaven and earth, Jesus says, go, therefore, and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Here we see two commands. Make disciples of all nations and baptizing them in the name of the Trinity. This verse has gained much attention in the modern attraction to Christian nationalism and its many forms. To understand what making disciples of all nations truly means, um, Dr. Jeff Moore of Grace Bible Theological Seminary helps us break down God's meaning in its original languages. This is a quick video. Um, it's very helpful. Um, and it's also very important to understand that and to remember that each text in the Bible that God has communicated through men by the power of his Holy Spirit, it only has one meaning. So at each verse that God is communicating, it only has one meaning. It can have many applications, but one true meaning. And so that's very important when we read and interpret scripture. So let's listen to this to discover what that one meaning is. Well, my goal this morning, at least in my first point, is to help you understand the Great Commission. I want to point out something that is essential for us to understand Matthew 28, 18 through 20, and it involves a grammar lesson. Every noun and pronoun has a gender attached to it, masculine, feminine, or neuter. And let me just say as an aside, the only positive thing about the pronoun revolution that is going on in our society right now is that now people know what a pronoun is. <laughs> Years ago, I cannot tell you the number of hours I would have to spend telling people that a pronoun is a word that's used in place of a noun. Examples are I, you, he, she, it, we, you, all, they. I would have whole classes chanting that with me. Now we know what a pronoun is. Well, every noun and pronoun does have a gender attached to it. What I would like to propose to you, and I would like for you to see in our passage in the Great Commission, is that in the original Greek, the gender of the noun nations is different from the gender of the pronoun them in the phrase baptizing them and the pronoun them in the phrase teaching them. So let me put it together for you like this, Matthew 28, 18 through 20. And Jesus came and said to them, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, neuter noun, ta ethne, baptizing them, masculine pronoun, altus, in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them, same masculine pronoun, altus, to observe all that I have commanded you. And behold, I am with you always to the end of the age." If Matthew is inspired by God, wanted to make a strict equation of nations equal to those who are baptized and equal to those who are taught, he could have used the same gender noun and pronouns. He actually should have used the same gender noun and pronouns. Matthew could have used a neuter pronoun them, alta, instead of altus, that would refer to the neuter noun nations. But what we have is a neuter noun nations followed by two masculine pronouns, them, the genders do not match. And here is the big point. The two thems in this passage are connected to the nations, but they are not identical to the nations. Let me say that again. The two thems in the Great Commission are connected to the nations, but they are not identical to the nations. This is why the translation, make disciples of all nations, is a better translation than just disciple all nations, because it pulls out the fact that there are individuals out of the nations who are the target here, not the nation as a whole. Our mission as the church is to disciple individuals 
who respond to the saving message of Jesus Christ in repentance and faith. Jesus calls us to disciple disciples. Jesus calls us to disciple believers. Make no mistake, based on the grammar of this passage, the target of the church is not to disciple an entire geographical political nation state, as Christian nationalists would have us believe. We are to target the them, masculine, out of the nation's neuter. We're to target those who respond to gospel proclamation. We must distinguish the part from the whole. That was very helpful to me. Do you agree? Please let me know in the comments section your thoughts on that text. I'll be linking the full sermons of this video in the description. Back to the Great Commission text. And, and finally, verse 20, teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you, and behold, I am with you always to the end of the age. This is the third command, teaching the disciples to obey all that Christ has commanded. This really is discipleship. And then Jesus, being the picture of love, comforts us by telling the disciples and to us that he will always be with us as we follow him all the days of our lives. That's comforting. That's good news for sinners like us. Having established the clear command of our Lord Jesus Christ and the importance of making disciples, let's turn our attention to Pastor John MacArthur as, as he teaches us the marks of discipleship in a clip from one of his sermons from John chapter 8, 31 through 36. That's why the Great Commission, Matthew 28, 19, 20, is to go into all the world and teach them to observe all things whatsoever I have commanded you. That's part and parcel of being saved. What happened when you were saved was you confessed Jesus as what? As Lord. Jesus is Lord. That's the great Christian confession. You said, Jesus is Lord, kurios. I am doulos, His slave. He is my master, my Lord, and that essentially defines what it means to be obedient. He's the master, I'm the slave. He is the sovereign. He is the ruler. He gives the orders and the commands. I respond in loving obedience. That is the distinction that our Lord made in the Sermon on the Mount, remembering how He ended that sermon in Matthew 7. He said, Everyone who hears these words of Mine and acts on them, does them, may be compared to a wise man who built his house on the rock. And the rain fell, and the floods came, and the winds blew and slammed against that house, and it didn't fall, for it had been founded on the rock. Everyone who hears these words of Mine and does not do them will be like a foolish man who built his house on the sand. The rain fell, the floods came, the winds blew, slammed against that house, and it fell, and great was its fall. The, the storm is judgment, and the house that falls is the house of the one who said but didn't do. It's not about profession. It's about continued loving obedience. This becomes clear through really all the gospel records, but listen to Matthew 12 and verse 50. Whoever does the will of My Father, Jesus said, whoever does the will of My Father who's in heaven. He is my brother and sister and mother. That is another way of saying He has a relationship with me. Whoever does the will of my Father. Same thing as what was in the Sermon on the Mount. It may not be easy to do that. Listen to chapter 10, verse 22. You will be hated by all because of my name, but it is the one who has endured to the end who will be saved. Enduring not only the good times, but persecution, hatred, even martyrdom. This marks a true believer. A true believer is marked by perseverance, by endurance. His faith does not fail. His faith does not fail. Matthew 24, 13, the one who endures to the end, he will be saved. The one who endures to the end. Now this is a major theme for John, and it's most um, opened up for us in the uh, upper room 
the night that Jesus met with His disciples to share the Passover. So turn to John 14 for just a minute because it's important to get this. And, and this is language you're very familiar with. We're just pulling it all together around this text, John 14, verse 15, if you love Me, this is not a request, this is a statement of fact, if you love Me, you will keep My commandments. If you love Me, you will keep My commandments. Down in verse 21, he who has My commandments and keeps them is the one who loves Me. And he who loves Me will be loved by My Father, and I will love him and will disclose Myself to him. Verse 24, he who does not love Me does not keep My words, and the word which you hear is not Mine but the Father's who sent Me. When you obey the Word of God, you are giving evidence of love that is the product of true regeneration. Romans 5 says, God has shed His love abroad in our hearts. Those that are genuine believers are literally filled with love. The fruit of the Spirit is love and all its manifestation. So love shows itself, first of all, in eager, willing, joyful obedience, even under duress, persecution, suffering, and facing death. In the fifteenth chapter of John, there is the same statement made in different words. Verse 10, John 15, 10, if you keep My commandments, you will abide in My love, just as I have kept My Father's commandments and abide in His love. How do we know the Son loved the Father? How do we know the Son loved the Father? The Son says, you know I love the Father because I obeyed the Father, because I did what the Father commanded me to do. I did only what the Father commanded me to do. As the Son demonstrates obedience and love to the Father, we demonstrate obedience and love to the Son. That's the pattern. That's how we demonstrate the genuineness of our conversion. Verse 14, you're My friends if you do what I command you. By the way, this is what it means to abide. Go back to verse 7, if you abide in Me and My words abide in you, you ask whatever you wish and it will be done for you. What does it mean to abide in Christ? It means to be in a true saving union with Christ. How do you know that's a reality? Because you know His Word and you are lovingly and eagerly obedient to it. Not perfect. You fail, you sin, you stumble, but you, but you hate the sin and you hate the stumbling. You're motivated by love to endure. John can't let go of this, so in his first epistle, uh, as he writes, he says this, chapter 2, verse 4, I have come to know Him. The one who says, I have come to know Him and does not keep His commandments is a liar. Wow. You say you know Him, but you don't keep His commandments? That's a lie. The truth is not in Him. Pretty simple. But whoever keeps His Word, in Him the love of God has truly been perfected. By this we know that we are in Him. That's what it means to abide, sharing life in Him. The one who says he abides in Him ought himself to walk in the same manner as he walked. And how did Christ walk? In obedience to the Father. And if you say you belong to Christ, then you walk in obedience to Christ as Christ walked in obedience to the Father. So what is the mark of a true believer? It's not a profession. It's not some past event. It is a continuing loving obedience, obedience out of love. You can't separate keeping commandments from love. They're all mingled in those passages in the upper room. John also is important, uh, it says it's important for us to acknowledge that Part of obeying is obeying the truth as sound doctrine. So in 2 John 9, he says, if anyone goes too far and doesn't abide in the teaching of Christ, he doesn't have God. The one who abides in the teaching has both the Father and the Son. If you have an errant Christology, if you err regarding who Christ is, and a lot of people say, I believe in Christ, but it's the wrong Christ. It's the wrong Christ, not the biblical Christ. You don't know God either. Sound theology and sound practice go together. 
This is an urgent issue with the Apostle John, so much so that in his first epistle, if I can go back there for just a moment, in chapter 3 and verse 24, he says it again, the one who keeps his commandments abides in him and he in him. And then in chapter 5, he says it again. In chapter 5, verse 3, this is the love of God that we keep His commandments and His commandments are not burdensome. So we are marked by our perseverance in loving obedience to the Word of God. That's how you know a true believer. That's how you know. And in the midst of persecution, persecution will not destroy his faith. Persecution will reveal the legitimacy of his faith, Peter says, and that'll be the proof of his faith which is a gift. You should pray for persecution. You should pray for difficulty. You should pray for suffering. If you have doubts about the legitimacy of your salvation, pray for suffering. Pray for dire circumstances and you will be given the greatest gift. If your faith survives, you'll know it's the real thing. So where there's no perseverance, there's no salvation. So if you're asking yourself, what about so-and-so? They don't come to church. They don't show an interest in the things of Christ. Pretty easy to answer the question. The benchmark is enduring faith, and that's a heavenly gift that cannot die because enduring faith, saving faith is a gift from God, Ephesians 2, 8 and 9. That's why the devil tried to destroy Job's faith and couldn't do it. The devil tried to destroy Peter's faith and couldn't do it. The devil assaulted Paul and couldn't destroy his faith because saving faith cannot be destroyed. The kind of faith that Judas had collapsed just on the prospect that he wasn't going to get as much out of this deal as he thought he deserved. So what is the benchmark then of true discipleship? It is perseverance and endurance in loving obedience to the Word of God. Let's draw some conclusions from Pastor John MacArthur's video. First of all, are you truly a disciple of Jesus Christ? We learn that a disciple loves Jesus and desires to obey all of His commandments. A disciple does, as the style of life, the will of the Father, Jesus' own words. A disciple will persevere through trials and tribulations because, as Dr. MacArthur said, they are motivated by love because God first loved them. Loving obedience, God says, is the mark of a true disciple. I hope that you can examine your own life and come to the conclusion that you truly are a disciple of Jesus Christ. Now that we've established very clearly what defines a true disciple, a redeemed, repenting believer trusting in Jesus Christ alone, let's answer the question, what is discipleship? Here's the definition we just heard from Pastor John MacArthur. Quote, so what is the benchmark then of a true disciple? It is perseverance and endurance and loving obedience to the Word of God. So def- benchmark of true discipleship, it is perseverance and endurance and loving obedience to the Word of God. And here's our working definition at Always Reforming Ministries. Discipleship is biblical faithfulness that pursues knowing, loving, and obeying Jesus Christ in all of life from a pure heart, and then helps others to do the same for the glory of God alone. Does this definition define you and your style of life? I encourage you to answer that question by examining your own life. Jesus said in John 15, 10, If you keep my commandments, you will abide in my love, just as I have kept my Father's commandments and abide in His love. Also, in 2 John 9, Jesus said, Everyone who goes on ahead and does not abide in the teaching of Christ does not have God. Whoever abides in the teaching has both the Father and the Son. Essentially, we can quote, looking back to what John MacArthur said, um, If you have a correct um, understanding of who Christ is, your sound doctrine will produce sound practice. Um, Those who persevere and abide in Christ, this is evidence that you actually know Him. 
Um, MacArthur said, it's really all about abiding in Christ out of our love for him. And he says, you will persevere, and that will be proof of your salvation in that you are a true disciple of Jesus Christ. And kind of summing up um, the end of his video, John MacArthur said, saving faith cannot be destroyed. You will persevere. God has saved you. Salvation is of the Lord. It's a faith that he deposited into your life. Um, it's a gift, and he will finish the work that he began in you. In closing, this channel exists to increase your affections for Jesus Christ, to exhort you to greater personal discipleship as you run the race of becoming more like him by the power of the Holy Spirit, to help you make disciples in obedience to Christ and love for neighbors, and to encourage you to examine your own life according to 2 Corinthians 13.5, where God commands you and me to test yourselves to see if you are in the faith. Examine yourselves, or do you not recognize this about yourselves, that Jesus Christ is in you, unless indeed you fail the test? Now will you pass the test? I pray that you will. I hope that God uses this channel to supplement your faith and build you up for His glory in this generation. Be always reforming. God bless you. Thank you for watching. I hope that you will take the time to subscribe, like this video, comment below your thoughts and um, how God is continuing to work in your life, and share it with someone you know who um, you care about their soul, you care about them faithfully following Jesus Christ. God bless you. Thank you.